On today's episode of Ask Dr. Bitcoin, we're gonna dive deep on what a smart contract is and help you pick the right cryptocurrency wallet for your use case. Stay tuned. Well, hello there. I am Mark Risen Hopkins, a Bitcoin and blockchain enthusiast. I've been studying and learning about the space since 2011, and uh, we're going to continue uh, kind of my brain dump into your mind of all things blockchain and cryptocurrency. So today we're going to be talking and extrapolating on the concept of smart contracts. It's something we teased in the last episode when we were talking about Turing complete blockchains, and it's part of kind of like a, a series of stepping stone concepts that kind of goes back to the first episode when we talked about what blockchain was specifically. Uh, it's a very revolutionary, transformative, and disruptive uh, concept. Uh, I think it drives a lot of my passion around blockchain, and it may not be readily apparent yet to you, but hopefully by the end of this episode it will be, as to how wide-reaching and, and disruptive this technology could be. Uh, the applications are so uh, kind of complex, we're going to have to take a few episodes to kind of get into it. Um, you, you start talking about uh, what it can what it can do, and the examples just kind of flow forth. It's very applicable, obviously, to the finance sector. You start looking at uh, supply chain, which is a huge uh, application that IBM is looking into at the moment uh, with with Hyperledger, and you also start looking at uh, uh, places where nobody's really looking into it, like uh, how it could disrupt government itself could actually remove the requirement for government. So anyway, these are, uh, these are a lot of the, the, the crazy ideas that you'll hopefully have a better grasp on by the time we get done with smart contracts, so stay tuned for that. Today we're going to talk about how to pick the right wallet for you. So we're going to go over about four different wallets, and the reason why I'm not saying the, how to pick the best wallet is because it's not necessarily a best wallet. These are four wallets that I like to use. They all have different attributes. We're gonna go over them and you'll see which ones you're gonna like, which ones you may not like, and uh, uh, which ones will work for what you're trying to do. The first one we're gonna go over with is Coinbase. Coinbase is a, uh, a, it's a specific kind of wallet unique from the rest of the ones we're gonna talk about because you don't get to store your private keys. What that means is that it's a little bit more like PayPal and a little bit less like a cryptocurrency wallet. There is a, a server and a client. You are not uh, actually uh, accessing your, all of your your, 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 your your coins are not stored locally. They're stored on the server somewhere. Your phone is the client. And as you can see here, it loads up and it gives you a nice, beautiful display. It's a good user experience. You're able to uh, jump in and, and it'll tell you what's uh, in your accounts. You can send and receive. Things are denominated uh, how you choose. I have mine denominated in, in the cryptocurrency first, but as you can see, it has the dollar amount below that. You can buy and sell from the wallet, which is uh, particularly unique for most of these cryptocurrency wallets. Probably the easiest one to learn. But as I said, you're trusting somebody else with your security, you're trusting somebody else with your private keys. Therefore, it kind of, uh, kind of removes a layer of what Bitcoin and blockchain is going to provide for you, which is the, the, the lack of requirement for trust. You actually do have to trust Coinbase to continue to exist for your coins to be uh, accessible to you. Fortunately, they're a venture-backed company based in Silicon Valley, licensed in all 50 states in the United States of America, so they'll probably be around for a little while, but there you go. All right, so the next wallet we're going to look at is, uh, my, is Coinomi. This is unique in that it is a uh, multi-wallet. There's several other wallets in this category, including uh, Jax, that will also do multi-wallets. But this one is particularly interesting in that it has probably the widest array of coins available for you to uh, choose from. You look at this list, it just keeps going and going. Uh, it's a little bit less user-friendly than uh, Coinbase we were just looking at. But it's still, it's still good enough. I mean, you got the US dollar representation up there. You click on that, you can see your history of your transactions. You can see how much Bitcoin you have in that wallet of the rough USD value of it. You can swipe to the left if you wanna receive and swipe to the right if you wanna send. And uh, it does, just like all cryptocurrency wallets, you can do a uh, QR code scan or you can uh, uh, copy and paste an address in there. You can type the, uh, the, the amount right there and it'll automatically translate that into Bitcoin. You uh, have the use all funds button that uh, really makes it a, easy to, to wipe out an entire wallet. 
An interesting property of Coinomi is anytime you hear about these hard forks, it's probably one of the first uh, wallets that will be out there that will support one of these new hard forks or these new uh, ICOs as they come out. So like when Bitcoin Cash came out or Bitcoin Gold came out, this was the wallet to use to uh, uh, access your coins first if you're going to cash them in or spend them or save them or do what you're going to do with them. The next wallet on our list to take a look at is Mycelium. This is uh, perhaps the earliest uh, wallet, probably the most trustworthy. Its code is maintained by some of the same folks that work on the core code. It's a little bit slower uh, than some of the other wallets, but it's, it's a quality uh, piece of work. It's going to be the most compatible with whatever is uh, uh, the, the current iteration of Bitcoin. It is not a multi-wallet, so all it's going to be good for is for Bitcoin. It will support any of the hard forks. It won't support any of uh, like Litecoin or Ethereum or any of those other types of cryptocurrencies. But it does a solid job of, of doing uh, just Bitcoin. And it, you can always trust that A, your private keys are secure and uh, that uh, you, you can control them and move them out uh, of, the, of the wallet if, if need be into a different wallet. And of course, the last one uh, that we're going to look at here is Green Wallet, which we showed you a little bit of last week, a little bit how to set that up. Green Wallet is unique amongst all these other uh, wallets in that uh, it is the only Bitcoin wallet that supports SegWit. Um, that may not mean much to you now uh, because we haven't explained the concept of SegWit, but all you need to know at this point is that SegWit will dramatically lower your transaction fees. The average transaction fee for a Bitcoin transaction can vary between $2 to $11 per transaction. With SegWit, it tends to vary between one cent and 11 cents per transaction, which is a significant difference. So uh, it's probably the least user-friendly of all the ones here uh, because it doesn't kind of walk you through it doesn't walk you through the, the steps, kind of assumes that you understand all the concepts. And uh, you know, as you can see, I mean, the user experience when you come into it is you're kind of staring at a blank page. So you have to kind of look around and, and, and kind of read some tutorials on the internet. But you know, if you're doing a lot of transactions on the internet, uh, a lot of transactions with cryptocurrency versus just saving and storing, this is the wallet that you want to use. Now, uh, going back to compare, the, this is the last thing we're going to talk about on this topic, the, the compare and contrast all these wallets together here. Coinbase, as I said, stores your private keys for you, doesn't allow you control of them. If you want to move your money out of Coinbase, you've got to physically send it to another wallet. You can't just back it up and restore it. With Coinomi, Mycelium, and Green Address, there is uh, a variety of ways to back up and restore your wallet and therefore have a little bit of added security around your money that you control yourself. In all three cases, they have what's called a BIP passphrase. That BIP passphrase is just an understandable series of 12 to 22 words like, you know, eagle, video, uh, share, like all these different words that are put together and you can write it down on a piece of paper. I think uh, you can see how we did that in the how to set up a green wallet video. And you can put that in a safe, you can save it into a, a secure online document. And if you lose your phone, you lose your wallets, you can always back up, back those uh, coins back into a new wallet on a new device. You can also use that same method to, for instance, take a Coinomi wallet, take that passphrase, and then load it up into a Mycelium wallet because maybe your needs change. You're not using alternative cryptocurrencies anymore. If you started off with Mycelium, you could do the opposite and take that passphrase and load it up into Coinomi. So that is a look at the most popular wallets that are out there, the ones that I would recommend you use, and hopefully the attributes that I've described and the ways that they work will help you judge which one is right for you. On today's What Is segment, we're gonna talk about smart contracts. Smart contracts are very simply just like a regular contract, except instead of being written in legalese, it's written in software. Instead of being stored in a file cabinet, it's stored on the blockchain. To get a little bit more specific and more accurate, uh, instead of it being uh, the, the wide-ranging uh, things that can be a, a contract can be judged by that are sometimes subjective, with, uh, with a smart contract, it must be something objectively measurable, something based on hard data. You know, objectively measurable examples are would be like how much money to, has has been sent into the smart contract uh, versus you know what color is the sky? Is it sort of a sort of a teal today, or maybe like more like an aquamarine? You know, something that's subject to uh, so, uh, you know 
differing opinions and still be considered correct. That's not a good criteria for something to put into a smart contract. Probably one of the most common applications of a smart contract today is ironically probably one of those easy ones to grasp uh, as an example as it's explained to you. Uh, you've probably heard the term ICO. It stands for Initial Coin Offering, and it's uh, kind of, they call it start, uh, started calling it that as a nod to the IPOs of Silicon Valley and elsewhere, where they're trying to raise money for a company. And a smart contract serves as a great vehicle for an initial coin offering or any type of uh, crowdfunding fundraising mechanism. Essentially, you have uh, a contract written in Solidity, stored in Ethereum, and uh, it has usually some very simple criteria. We have a number of tokens, which can be representative of shares in a company that are sitting inside the smart contract. And then you have your money that sits out over here, usually stored in Ethereum. And the smart contract simply looks for some value of Ethereum to enter into the smart contract, to be sent to the smart contract and says, okay, well, I know each one of these shares or tokens is gonna to be valued at 0.5 Ethereum. So every time someone sends me 0.5 Ethereum, I'm gonna shoot back at them one token. It's a very, like I said, objectively measurable, very simple, and it's all taken place in escrow. If that was an in-person transaction, uh, either through an IPO or through a corporation or an individual that's selling equity, you would have several people involved and perhaps maybe even several organizations involved, people that are writing the contract, administering the contract, uh, you know, like NASDAQ, lawyers, banks, all these other organizations that get involved. All of these that are simply uh, uh, replaced with uh, several lines of code and administered by uh, thousands, if not, thousands upon thousands of machines out there working in concert. So that's just a very high level view of how the most simple smart contract can, can work. We'll get into all the different applications of smart contracts in future episodes, so stay tuned for that. Well, there you have it, your blockchain and cryptocurrency prescription. As always, these are just my thoughts and I encourage you to seek out a second opinion. Subscribe for more videos on blockchain and cryptocurrency. And if you enjoyed today's video, share it with a friend so they can watch. Thank you for watching our show and don't forget to see the receptionist on your way out. We discovered, so our, our car is Canadian, because uh, it's, it's uh, it will, we figured that out because it was, it's the, the primary is kilometers instead of miles on the speedometer. And we're like, oh. where, why? And so I looked at the Carfax report, it was bought in Canada. So the inside smaller part is miles per hour? Yeah. So you have to look there to see how fast you're Yeah, it's annoying as shit. <laughs> you really can't see it unless you got the headlights on. It's not great.